May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> we may sometimes ask ourselves, why do Christians revere so greatly characters like Abraham, Moses, St. Peter, and other biblical figures. I mean, after all, some of them, some of our most famous characters, don't even seem particularly nice, let alone figures that deserve veneration. Some of them did or said or believed some pretty awful and wild things, after all. This is quite often a fundamental and important question to people who are seeking and it's one that deserves a thoughtful answer. It is entirely too easy to accept and assume and gloss over why we do things the way we do as Christians. It is a useful practice, however, periodically to unpack our historical, critical, and faith baggage in order to remember and understand. If we don't do so, how can we explain the faith we hold, so dear and so holy, to seekers and to newcomers? Why would any rational 21st century person think it is acceptable to hold up ex as examples of faith a motley cast of murderers, adulterers, polygamists, tricksters, liars, and participants in systems that oppress and endanger women and children and vulnerable elders. No wonder a lot of folks think that we're an odd bunch, to say the least. In the Lenten study course that we've commenced already, we've learnt that our history is patterned by all shapes and all sizes of characters in the rhythms and the patterns of our discipleship. Most of us have come to accept that this is just the way that things are in this matter called faith, in which we claim to participate in many and varying degrees. But texts of terror, texts of terror and unsavory stories found in the Holy Scriptures are often sanitized for Sunday school children, edited for the lectionary, or completely obscured in unturned pages of holy writ. It is, after all, much easier to ignore or gloss over those stories we do not quite understand, or which we wish were not part of our history. Behind that insightful question of why, and how do they form part of our history, lies that pesky, persistent human assumption that works define the person, that works define the person. This mighty mental struggle continues to plague our thought pattern, patterns and even our practice of faith, despite the admonitions of such mighty figures as St. Paul, St. Augustine, Martin Luther, and even Christ himself. It is through our faith by grace alone that salvation happens. It is God's work not our log of good deeds or pitiful penance for the wrongs we so easily commit. The epistle lesson for this week points out that Abraham, in that complicated and very convoluted um, articulation we heard from St. Paul read by Howard earlier on, we hear all about Abraham, one of the most revered and important patriarchs of Christianity, of Judaism, and of Islam as well, that he did not receive God's promise to make him the father of many nations through the law or through his own goodness or works, but rather through his faith. Father Abraham believed that God is able to accomplish that which God promises. Sure, Abraham 
was imperfect and sinful, but he also knew exactly where to place his faith and his trust, and that made all the difference. It continues to make a difference for us today as we look to him not as a picture of perfection, but rather as an example of lived faith. Along the same lines, St. Peter, in the passage from St. Mark's Gospel that we've just heard, finds himself rebuked strongly by the Christ. The problem is a variation on the theme of letting one's human fallenness get in the way. That comes up over and over again with St. Peter. St. Peter has all the right motivations, but still he misses the point. He wants Christ to conform to his notion of what the Messiah should look like and how he should act. St. Peter had great faith, but he still had trouble understanding and aligning his will with, with Christ's own way. Even so, Christ addresses him as rock and used St. Peter as a powerful pointer in the furtherance of the reign of the kingdom of God on earth. You know, sometimes the distinctions between gratitude and honor and veneration and idolatry wear thin. Yet the Holy Scriptures and church history make it clear that only God and God alone deserves our adoration, our complete devotion, and our worship. We look to the faithful example of the saints, of those who point the way to God and who illumine the grace and steadfast love of Christ, not to them as an end in themselves, but as they point to God. No, these saints were not perfect people. In fact, they could be real stinkers. But then, so can we. None of us are perfect. As Martin Luther so keenly observed, simul justus et peccator, we are righteous and at the same time we are sinners. That goes for all who have who, or who do or who will draw breath and seek to follow God. It is good to give thanks for the saints and for their company and to venerate them, those who have gone before us in the past and who persevere even in the present age. In their lives we catch glimpses of hope that we too are heirs of the promises of God himself. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.